All right, we're going to take some notes here that are going to address this question. What effect do ecological disruptions have on ecosystems? So let's get started here, and we'll define disruptions. Uh, these are changes in environmental conditions that result in profound changes to population sizes of different species within that system. Uh, disruptions are going to uh, threaten and uh, even decrease biodiversity within an ecosystem. Here's an example of a disruption here, a forest fire. Uh, this could be either natural or anthropogenic, right? Human caused. Uh, you can argue that uh, this is natural and that the lightning bolt started it, or you can even argue that it's anthropogenic because uh, climate change is causing drier conditions and some of these forests are now more prone to forest fires because of that. All right, so... Uh, climate change, I just mentioned, can be both natural and anthropogenic, too. Uh, there are these cycles on our Earth about every 100,000 years or so of uh, spikes in uh, increased, decreased uh, uh, temperatures. Uh, but it seems that uh, there's increased carbon dioxide emissions in our atmosphere are causing these temperatures to increase even more uh, at a faster rate. And we're seeing evidence of that in decreased, uh, you know, sea ice and rising sea temperatures and raising sea levels as well, in addition to these uh, intense storms that are seem to be happening more and more. Uh, so here's a graph. Uh, this is the, these are the changes in atmospheric CO2 concentration and Antarctic temperature over the past 800,000 years. The temperature is on the left and the concentration is on the right. Uh, take a look here. In fact, I'd like you to push pause and um, write down, jot down a couple of the thoughts here answering that question in red. What trends do you see? Some of the things you could have said, it seems that the concentration of the CO2 is increasing even more than it ever has been uh, recently, uh, spiking up in at least this graph at 400 parts per million. And you also mention also uh, the swing or the shift in temperature seems to go from about uh, 12 degrees Celsius, uh, plus or minus, uh, these two extremes. All right, so here are a couple different types of ecological disruptions. These are the natural ones here, fires, floods, storms, uh, disease, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, those fluctuations in climate that are uh, natural. Um, and then we've got the anthropogenic disruptions here, these human-caused disruptions. And these are really the focus of uh, the bulk of this class here in apes. Uh, so habitat loss and land use changes, we'll discuss. Uh, habitat fragmentation, we kind of uh, uh, touched on that earlier when we uh, build a canal down one habitat and fragment it, fragment it into two. Um, air, land, water pollution, mining, deforestation, global change includes not just global warming, but also rising sea levels and uh, those uh, that, that decreased sea ice that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the two that we'll talk here in this unit are the removal of keystone species, our huge disruptions, and uh, the introduction of invasive species, too. All right, so uh, let's try to get into this here. Uh, what effect do disruptions have on ecosystems? Uh, extinctions is one effect. Another effect is migration. Another effect here is uh, ecological succession. And uh, finally, adaptations. So we're going to go through each one of these briefly and, and touch on each one. Let's talk about extinction first. Extinction occurs when uh, conditions change uh, so rapidly that a species cannot adapt genetically. And uh, so what starts to happen, right? These, uh, imagine habitat loss is probably the biggest uh, reason why extinct extinction is going to occur. And uh, yeah, think about that, right? We're wiping out habitat. There's nowhere else for these uh, organisms to go, especially those plants that can't migrate out. And uh, so we're seeing them die off more and more. Uh, however, you know, extinction is natural process, but you can see in this graph uh, that it seems, uh, you know, past that industrial revolution time in the mid 1800s, uh, the rates of extinctions are increasing uh, much more re readily. Uh, let's see, oops, there we go. Uh, the other one that we mentioned, migration, uh, right, movement in or 
out of an area, there's a way that you can remember the, the difference between the two uh, types of migration, right? Immigration uh, with an I, you can say into, right? More movement into an area or country. And emigration is when one exits their country and goes to another. Uh, here's another way that uh, uh, disruptions uh, are going to lead to these, right? Ecological succession here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in Unit 2.7, but if you're looking here, I'll kind of walk you through it. Uh, look at uh, uh, 1 and 8. They look roughly the same, right? So imagine some disruption comes through at 2. It looks like a fire. That fire might not necessarily be a bad thing because it's going to help recycle some of those nutrients tied up in that biomass. And that gets, it gets into the soil here at 4. Uh, then we've got some of these pioneer species, these uh, species that are going to be able to uh, very quickly come in and uh, take root in these uh, very fertile soils, right? Uh, what do we see here? These guys are usually the, the types of plants that are going to be carried on the, uh, by birds or on the wind. Uh, in 6 and 7, you're seeing larger plants, taller plants, out competing some of those earlier plants. And uh, as they outcompete, they're able to get up, you know, access the sunlight and really kind of crowd out some of the other organisms that might be competing uh, for that same sunlight until eventually we have something that resembles uh, the f original forest, and that's ecological succession. We'll talk about both primary and secondary, too. We just uh, went over secondary, but there's more to the story, so hold tight on that. And then uh, adaptations. Adaptations, these guys are uh, traits that improve on an individual's ability to survive and reproduce. So imagine for a moment that you are a finch. Uh, finches might eat soft grass or tougher seeds. If you're looking here at this uh, finch on the left, this guy here has got a smaller beak, so I'm more likely to eat that softer grass versus the guy with the larger beak who might want to prefer the, the tougher seeds. Uh, so here's how directional selection can start to work. Imagine for a moment that uh, we've got uh, some sort of a drought, right? And the drought kind of is this selection here so that we're, uh, we're pushing against uh, and knocking out the folks that are able to uh, eat those have a smaller beak and eat those softer grasses that are no longer going to be present because of the drought, right? And so we're getting a shift then in that phenotype of a bird that is able to survive and reproduce a little bit more because it's able to eat uh, its, its seeds, uh, which requires a larger beak. And because it survives and reproduces, it passes on that uh, big beak trait to its offspring. Um, so take a look here. Uh, this is another opportunity for you guys to pause the video, uh, read this question, and take a look at the graph. I've got a question for you that I'd like to you to write and respond to in your notes, answering that red question there, and we'll talk about it in class. Thank you very much.